It's nice to have children in the church, isn't it? Amen. Parents, even when they're fussing, I'm still happy to have them here. <laughs> because it tells me that a church has a future. And uh, we appreciate your children, love your children. We're going to be studying uh, Romans 8 today. This is going to be a study, so you're going to have to, you know, kind of pull up the seatbelt a little tighter and hold on because we're going to go through this. Uh, And I came to the realization in working on what I was going to speak about today that I can't do chapter 8 in one sermon, so we're going to have to come back and look at it again. But let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer, okay? Father in heaven, I pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to use these words and to glorify your name. Dear Lord, I feel inadequate, but I know that your spirit isn't. And so we ask for him to be here, please, and to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever I study the book of Romans, it seems like I I always bide my time until I get to chapter 8, because everything that Paul has been working up to gets revealed in chapter 8, and that's where we're at today. Everything that he writes in Romans comes up to chapter 8, and everything he writes after chapter 8 is based on what he revealed in those, in those verses. But I want to give you just a brief overview today of the chapters leading up to chapter 8, kind of a quick review of what we've looked at so far. In chapters 1, 2, and, and most of 3, Paul is making it clear that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we are justified freely by the grace of God through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified by faith apart from any deeds of the law. Now he quickly goes on to say, and we're going to talk about this a little more, faith does not nullify the law of God. Okay, so there are a lot of Christians who come away with the idea that faith somehow sets aside the law of God. That's not true. In chapter 4, We learn that both Abraham and David were righteous by faith. Remember, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So righteousness by faith is an Old Testament concept. But more than that, if righteousness is by faith, and Abraham was righteous by faith, then those who share the faith of Abraham become his children and inherit with him the promises of God. Like Abraham, we are justified or made righteous by faith. In chapter 5, Paul begins by saying this. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And remember the verses about the glory of God that we talked about? It's, an, it's a fascinating study. If you haven't done, done it before, look through all of the New Testament passages that talk about the glory of God, or the Bible, not just the New Testament. The deal with the glory of God. The glory of God is what? Do you remember? What is the glory of God? His, who, somebody just said it. It's his character, isn't it? It's his character. And we were created with that likeness. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created in the image of God. They were created with that likeness to him. We were a reflection of his character. But that reflection of the likeness of God was damaged by the presence of sin. According to Paul in chapter 5, we have the hope of having that glory and that likeness to God restored within us. And it goes on to talk about the trials and the struggles of life. And it says that they are the very things that help reshape within us the character of God. Now Paul continues in chapter 5 to say that while we were still God's enemies, Christ, his son, died for us and reconciled us. Because of Adam's sin, death passed to all humanity. The opportunity for life is offered to all of humanity through the righteousness of Christ. And then probably one of the most significant, maybe the most beautiful passages in the, book, in the Bible comes in Romans 5. It says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through wrath through him. 
For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. God didn't wait according to these verses, until we were banging on the gates of heaven to open the door a crack and shout out, what do you want? Get off my steps. You know, God didn't wait for us to come banging on the door before helping us. He is the initiator in salvation. God is the one who initiated this whole thing. He's the one who came after us. He came looking for us, like the good shepherd looking for his lost sheep. We were still his enemies. When Jesus covenanted to give himself for our sins, it's an incredible revelation of the love of God that he comes for us. He comes looking for us. Romans 6 tells us that we are dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. We have been baptized into the death of Christ, and we have been raised with him in newness of life. Therefore, according to Romans 6, we are no longer slaves to sin. In Romans chapter 7, it's where it gets interesting. This one chapter, you'll remember, I told you, was, was probably the one chapter that has been the source of, of discussion and, and controversy in the entire history of the Christian church. All through the centuries of, of the history of Christian church, they've been trying to figure out what Paul is saying here in Romans 7. I believe that Paul is simply clarifying the process that brought him to the point to where he understood grace. In Romans 7, verse 9, he says, I was alive once without the law. There was a time when Paul didn't know right from wrong. He didn't have the law in front of him, so he didn't know that he had done anything wrong. He couldn't be held responsible for the things that he didn't know. But that changed. He says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Paul didn't know right from wrong until the law came. And then he realized when he looked at it that he was guilty of having breaking the law and that he deserved death. So he's on this journey of understanding, of coming to understand grace. The third step comes in verse 14. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Paul saw the holiness and the righteousness of the law. He longed to obey it, but he found another law at war with the law of his mind. And he calls that law later in Romans the law of sin and death. No matter how hard he tried, there was this thing in him that made it impossible to obey the law of God. Just as a clarification, Paul has spoken a number of times about the law of God, and there are those who read into Romans the idea that God has somehow abandoned the law of God. Let me show you some verses. You know, Paul, every time he brings it up and he talks about us not being saved by the law, he quickly corrects any misunderstandings understandings about what he's saying. Here's, let me give you several verses. Romans 3.28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 3.31 is a quick response. Do we make void the law through faith? What? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So just in case you thought that because we are justified apart from deeds of the law, that that does away with the law, Paul quickly corrects that. The next one is this. Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So every time Paul makes a statement, he adds a corrective to make sure that we don't misunderstand. Next one, Romans 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members, of, as, members as, right, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion, dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. 
Oh, here it is again. Here's the one everyone worries about. But look at the next one here. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? What's the answer? Now remember, 1 John 3 verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Some translations, sin is the transgression of the law. So what is Paul saying? Is he saying that because we're not under law, anything goes now? No, not at all. The next one, Romans 7, verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were, what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. But here it comes again, Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. The point is that Paul has been making all throughout his book is that the law cannot save us. The reason why it can't save us is because we have already broken it. We've already violated it. Let me tell you what I told you before. And it's a trick statement, so listen carefully. You know that you can be saved by the law, right? Here's how you have to do it. You have to obey it absolutely perfectly. And to have always obeyed it perfectly. So even if the first were possible, guess what? The second isn't. We've already broken it. We've already broken it. But because we are not saved by works of the law does not mean that we are excused from obeying it. Everything Paul has said makes that much clear. Paul in chapter 7 talks about the war that is waged in his mind. He sees the beauty of the law of God and he longs to obey it. But there's something else at work in his life. He calls it the law of sin and death. And that law of sin and death keeps him a slave to sin. The answer to the problem comes in the very last verses of Romans 7. It says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. Jesus is always the answer to every problem, isn't it? Isn't he? Jesus, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then comes Romans 8 verse 1. I've been waiting for this for months. <laughs> Romans 8 verse 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. spirit. According to the Spirit. There it is. There it is, brothers and sisters. What Paul has been building up to is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What was impossible before becomes possible when the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. When the Holy Spirit takes his place in our heart, slavery to sin is broken. Slavery to sin is broken. Romans 8 verse 3, it says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What is it that the law cannot do? I've already said it once. It cannot save us. For what the law was, was, could not do because it was weak through the flesh, it couldn't save us. God did. So the law can't do, it can't do what? It can't save us. But God can do what? God can save us. But God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Anyone who thinks that faith makes obedience irrelevant doesn't get it. They don't understand grace. Verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law. Now, I've done this at prayer meeting, and some of you have an advantage. The requirements of the law. What are the requirements of the law? I'm speeding. What's the speed limit out here? 45? I come through here 70 miles an hour. What happens to me? I get, if, I, if I get caught, don't you wish there some police, you wish that, where are the cops when you need them? <laughs> where are the policemen when you need them? I'm coming through here at 70 miles an hour, I'm breaking the speed. The speed limit requires what? Obedience. Obedience. 
It requires obedience. So Paul says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There it is again. There it is again. It takes the Holy Spirit in our hearts for us to meet the righteous requirements of the law. Paul has been building up to this. He's been telling us all along that we are not saved by works of obedience to the law. You cannot, by being a strict, obedient person, atone for all of the things that you've done wrong in the past. There's only one person who can atone for that. Who is it? Jesus Christ Christ is the only one who can atone for our sins. But because he atones for our sins, doesn't make sin now permissible. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and he begins to do the work that we can't do for ourselves. He, he, he comes into our hearts and enables us. The presence of the Holy Spirit changes everything. It changes, he changes everything. What was impossible before only becomes possible through the Holy Spirit living in us. And now everything that Paul is going to be, write, be writing in this chapter is going to be based on that. Look at this. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. In other words, the carnal carnal mind is at war with God, it is not subject to the law, and couldn't be even if it wanted to. That's what's being said. It couldn't be, even if it wanted to be. Paul, in in chapter 7, describes the law. He sees it. He knows it's the right thing. He longs to be obedient to that law. But he finds that there's something else at work in him that keeps him from doing it. Paul is saying here in this verse, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's at war with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It couldn't be even if it wanted to. Verse 8 says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But listen to this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us that breaks the hold of sin in the life. He empowers us to do what was impossible without him. It goes on, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... He is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Remember that in Christ, we have died to sin, but we've been raised to new life. We've been raised to new life. It says, as in Christ, as if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If the spirit of Christ lives in me, then when, even in this mortal body, I was telling people this morning, I woke up, you know, there are days you wake up and the arthritis just hurts more. <laughs> I don't know whether it was the drop in the temperatures or, or what it was or the change in the atmosphere, but I woke up this morning, I'm in as stiff as a board, you know. Just trying to, trying to, you know, stagger my way through life without having to bend too much to do anything because it hurts a little too much. But even in this mortal, weakened body, this broken down, arthritic body of mine, I can live for Jesus when the Spirit is living in me. It goes on. It says, For you did not receive for the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Paul is telling us that when we surrender to become the slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, that something interesting happens. That we come as slaves, won by God's love, only to hear him say, you are my child. You are my child. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him that we might also be glorified, glorified together. He understand that everything that has been happening now in this chapter, once Paul reveals that it is the working of the Holy Spirit that changes us, everything he writes from this point on is going to be based on what he's revealed. 
The Bible hasn't made sin permissible. Faith in Jesus doesn't make sin permissible or legal. The Bible introduces us to the one person in the Trinity that the presence of the Holy Spirit that can change us and help us to live for Christ. Amen. Obedience becomes possible through the workings of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to this statement. It comes from a little book called True Revival, Spirit of Prophecy book. And it says, the spirit-filled life results not only in personal victory. Well, I can let you read it here because it's on here. Somewhere along my life, I, I fell behind. The spirit-filled life results not only in personal victory over sin, but also in a fresh desire and ability to share the Christian life and hope with others. Fulfilled with the power of the Holy Spirit, God's faithful ones will proclaim the final message that will prepare a people for the Lord's return. Satan will do everything in his power to stop it. He will try to convince us that there are shortcuts, easier ways to have fellowship with God that leads to an empowered Christian life. He will introduce counterfeits for the power of the Spirit, counterfeits so deceptive that if God's people do not maintain a deep living relationship with him based on the word of God, they will be deceived. This book, and it's talking about this book here, this book will, among other things, help the reader to distinguish between the true and the false. Remember that I told you that no true revival comes without a serious study of the Bible. Amen. You know, it's one of Satan's masterful deceptions to cause what looks like a revival. But in that revival, it draws you away from the clear teaching of God's word. It, it's, it's one of his greatest tricks to make something look like it has power, but at the same time, it's denying the very teachings of the word of God. The Holy Spirit does not move apart from the book that he has inspired to be written. But when we study the Bible and we seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he takes the words of this book and uses them to change us. You will never experience revival unless you are, you are spending significant time every day in the Word of God. Making it a routine, making it a part of your schedule during the day to spend that time in reading through some chapters of the Bible and praying and asking for the Holy Spirit, that's the only way you're going to really experience revival. And you know what? Satan is terrified that God's people will figure this out. He's terrified that we might actually figure out what power there is in praying for the Holy Spirit in our lives and spending time in his word. But brothers and sisters, if you want revival, we're living in an interesting time. The storms are getting more severe. The things that are going on around us are becoming much more intense. They are all warnings and signs that Jesus is coming. And more than ever, we need to become committed to seeking God in his word. You know, we're quickly coming up to the end of the year, so I'm not going to rush too far ahead. That, but, you know, I, at the end of the year, I always challenge people to read through their Bible in a year. Um, I read the daily Bible. It has an Old Testament chapter and a New Testament chapter of Psalms and Proverbs for every day, 365 days. So if you keep up with the dates, December 31st, you've read through the whole Bible. Sandy calls it the perfect Bible for the ADD brain. <laughs> just, just about when you've had it with the begats in the Old Testament, you get to the New Testament. And, and it breaks it up enough. But I, I'm so used to it. I've been using it for years, you know. 365 days. If you read all three, all the way through, if you, if you keep up with it, and I'm behind, but if you keep up with it, December 31st, you've read through the whole Bible. But brothers and sisters, you've got to start studying. Amen. You know, it, we're living in a time and age now. We're living in a time when you have to become serious about your connection with God through his word. I have one other thing I want to give out today. And, you know, I love to give out these things. I know you're, by the time I leave here as pastor, you're going to have about 200 of these stuck in your Bible. Um, but let's give these out if we can. Um, it's a little thing in, that I have entitled the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I put in here Luke 13, what we had for our scripture reading, Luke 11, 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
And then below is a little prayer that I wrote, Father, I long to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Please send him to take his place in my heart today and every day. And every time I do this, I kind of edit it. But brothers and sisters, I got to tell you, you know, I can't think of anything more important to talk to you about than this. You've heard me say it before. I have to repeat it again. I believe it's one of the critical discoveries in my spiritual walk with Christ that I begin every day asking for the Holy Spirit to take up residence in my heart again. Yes, we are given the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I believe the Holy Spirit to be a sensitive individual. I believe that he will not force his way where he is not wanted. And I believe that we are responsible to come to the Lord every day and to ask again, Father, give me today the gift of your Holy Spirit. Be in control of my words. Be in control of my thoughts. Be in control of my attitudes. Your attitudes are going to shape a lot of what happens during the day. So we have to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit to shape even our attitudes. To be right with the Lord. I can't, I can't begin to tell you how important I believe this to be. That we have to begin to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit every day. And if I were to re-edit this, when I looked at it this morning, I, thought I, thought I, I, I looked at it and I thought, you know, I should have put in there a line that says, I covenant to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit every day. So write it in there. The next time you see one like this, it'll have that in there. I, I can't begin to tell you how important I believe this to be. The Holy Spirit will make changes in us that you can't believe. What I'm challenging everybody to do is to begin every day, every morning, first responsibility. Your first responsibility in the morning is to get on your knees and say, Lord, give me again today the gift of your Holy Spirit. I started to say that I, I believe we're given the Holy Spirit when we accept Christ. But I believe the Holy Spirit to be a sensitive individual. And I think he wants to be invited every day. Amen. I think he wants to be invited every day. And it's a reminder to us to surrender ourselves in the moment we wake up in the morning to the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit, that we're asking Him to take His place in our heart. And we are asking Him to be in control of what happens during the day, to be in control of my words, to be in control of my thoughts and my actions, to be in control of my attitudes. I'll tell you this quickly. Um, I've, I've told the story before, but some of you probably haven't heard it. And, it. and it involves my own personal life. We have a son who most of you know is, is quite sick. And uh, he, is, he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a disease that's destroying his liver. There's nothing he did. It's an autoimmune disorder. And uh, my son dealt with, has dealt with a lot of anger. And a counselor once that I spoke to said, of course he's angry. Who wouldn't be angry having to face that in his life? And, uh, but what happened is that, you know, one day my son got really upset he was, when he was still living with us. And he started yelling and he said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, you know. And it's the sort of trigger points that would have caused me to respond with, you better not think you're going to do that and live here, you know. And it would have wound up in a major confrontation. But I had been praying, God, you know. In fact, I, I was actually seeing a counselor in, in large part because this is now a matter of his life. And so, Lord, I don't want to botch this one up. I don't want to mess this one up. And so I've been praying, Holy Spirit, please be in control of what comes out of my mouth. And he is shouting at me and he's yelling at me in the kitchen. And the, and the thoughts going through my head is he better not think he's going to do that and get away with it. But it was a moment of, of almost this twilight zone moment where what's in my head is not what's coming out of my mouth. What's coming out of my mouth is we're in this with you. You're not alone. You're not going to fight this alone. And mom and I are going to be with you all the way through this. You can't give up. Whatever happens, you can't give up. And he stopped in the middle of all of this and looked me square in the eyes and came over and put his head on my shoulder and cried like he would have when he was a little boy. And it was the first moment I felt like I had that real confirmation that the very thing I had asked, that the Holy Spirit would be in control of my words, that he had put a lock on my brain and wouldn't let come out of my mouth the things that were in my head. 
And what was coming out of my mouth was completely different than what was in my head. I really believe this stuff. I can't, I can't begin to tell you how critical I think it is that if you want to walk the Christian life, then you need to be asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit in the morning. You need to start the day by asking that the Holy Spirit take control of your mind and your words, your actions, your attitudes. I can't begin to tell you how important I think this is. This is the way real revival happens, by the way. You committed to doing this? Amen. Let me see your hands. You committed to praying and asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit every day? Father in heaven, I pray for these people and I pray for myself. This world is coming apart at the seams and Lord, more than ever, we need to know what it means to walk with you. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there every morning to remind us to ask for his presence and his blessing. Dear Lord, give us again the gift of your Holy Spirit today. We pray that you will reveal yourself through us to the people around us, that our lives will be so transformed and changed that they will want to know why we're different. Please, Lord, please, Lord, I ask, I beg, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.